So, uh, so yes, do you, have you collected all of your panelists right? I think we have two online. We have two, then perfect. Then perfect, okay. I think we have rounded up all of our um, colleagues here uh, to share their information on the next session. Um, so really federal state perspectives on offshore wind transmission planning, a uh, lot, lot to cover. Um, and therefore, since I don't know very much about this, I'm gonna turn it over to somebody who knows it incredibly, more than he ever probably thought he ever would uh, about these issues and many, many more. But uh, again, right, Frank, if you'd come up and uh, lead the panel, appreciate it. Thank you. Um, all right, good afternoon, everyone. We are, this is the transmission panel, the, the much awaited, I'm sure. Um, I, want, I want to take a second to thank you, thank all the people who helped put this together, uh, Janet, Nick, Leanne, Tony, Avalon, Christy, September, and probably other people I'm forgetting, for which I apologize. Um, but we're going to be moderating a session on offshore wind transmission. Uh, my transmission is something that has been near and dear to my heart for a long time. Uh, before I started at Boehm in 2009, I worked in a uh, law firm doing uh, so basically, basically studying everything that uh, FERC does, and a lot of what FERC does is transmission. So uh, RTOs and, and transmission uh, are, mean a lot to me. I, I've, I've been involved in it for a long time, and I've, I'm excited to be uh, here with some people who really know quite a bit about this. Um, we, uh, this discussion will build off of uh, uh, the offshore wind transmission webinar series that we held in uh, 2021 that MAKO held with NROC at that time um, and Marco. Uh, these, those in two, the webinars in 2021 were designed to increase understanding and promote dialogue about offshore wind transmission planning in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. Uh, that doesn't seem that far that long ago, but a lot has happened since then, and there's a lot of news uh, to, to talk about, which we'll be doing today. Um, so we are pleased to have Federal, state, industry representatives with us today and online. We have five panelists uh, who are going to give perspectives on a, a number of different angles on offshore wind transmission planning. Um, we have uh, Dr. Jen Fu, uh, program lead with the uh, Department of Energy Systems Integration Wind Energy Technologies Office. That's a mouthful. Uh, Josh Ganji, Renewable Energy Program Specialist with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, one of my colleagues, and uh, Dr. Kira Lawrence, a senior scientist uh, with New Jersey BPU. Um, let's see, we, we're going to, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna go through the first three speakers. Uh, to, these are our federal and state perspectives. The other ones are um, our industry, and uh, so that, that's gonna be the, the general breakdown here. Um, if you have questions, write them down. I think, I, hopefully you've been provided note cards and, it, and if you're on site and if you're not on site, you can do uh, the, the question and answer the Q&A field of the chat. Um, all right, and we are going to save all the feedback that we get on today's um, session to help us, help guide us as we go forward and plan. Uh, we, we have more transmission um, outreach and webinars planned um, that we'll, we'll talk briefly about before we close. So I'm going to jump right into our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Jen uh, Fu is from, is from the Department of Energy. Uh, she's going to give us an update on the Atlantic Offshore Wind Transmission Study. Jen is the program lead for, system, for the system integration team in the Wind Energy Op Technologies Office. In this role, she leads the collaborative research, development, demonstration, and deployment of technologies uh, to ensure a cost-effective, cyber-secure, reliable, and resilient power grid with increasing uh, levels of wind. Prior to joining DOE in 2016, Dr. Fu had more than 15 years of experience in the private sector, including various engineering positions at different product lines at Alstom, which is now GE, and three years as co-founder of a utility software startup company. So, Jen, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, right. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jian Fu. Um, thanks for having me here today, and thanks for your interest in this uh, DOE-launched Atlantic Offshore Wind Transmission Study. So the Transmission Atlantic Study has been uh, over 
18 years, uh, 18 months by now. So it's difficult to summarize everything we did in the past 18 months in the short 15 minutes. So I stay really high level and hopefully give you a full picture and a little drill down what the latest results are. Uh, so just to, uh, quickly, let's just go over some background. So the study was driven by, um, by the gigawatts of offshore wind pipeline city in the, uh, at the interconnection queue at different phase of interconnection process driven by the state renewable energy goals or the procurement activities, of course, uh, driven by the administration's 30 gigawatt by 2030 goal of offshore wind and also a very ambitious or a bright future of 110 gigawatt by 2050. Um, DOE did our uh, due diligence. We spent quite a amount of time doing our homework before uh, launching the study. So we, we had a uh, request for information um, that was released end of 2020. We completed a literature review and gap analysis that was released in 2021. And in summer of 2021, BOEM, DOE, and we had a series of offshore wind transmission scoping meeting that I believe we met probably a few of us here. And also, uh, Joshua covered a little more detail on the, the last bullet point. After the launch of the study, uh, Boehm and DOE had a series of Atlantic Offshore Wind Transmission Convening Workshops. Um, so the workshop was partially informed by the preliminary results of the study, and then also the workshop um, with the information that we collected through the workshops that reshaped a little bit of the study original scope. Um, so the study, as I just said, study uh, is a two-year effort that just completed the, the three quarters of the work. Researchers from uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, PNNL, deserve all the credit for doing the real work. Um, so um, the scope of the study really look at 2030 to 2030, 2050 uh, for the offshore wind transmission needs um, along the Atlantic coast from Maine to, the South, Car to South Carolina. Um, I'm not going to cover the study objectives, just want to let you know that. By now, the study have identified two core scenarios, five offshore wind transmission topologies. That combination of those could represent several pathways to achieving this offshore wind deployment goals for 2050. The study has collected more than 25 layers of siting data um, that has been used to drive the cable routing analysis and further inform the cost of transmission uh, investment. We have uh, completed mostly the production cost analysis for those topologies. Um, the benefit and cost analysis are currently ongoing, um, along with reliability and resilience analysis for the grid. Um, so just want to let you know that we're going to have a, a technical review committee meeting tomorrow afternoon uh, where labs will share much more detailed information. So uh, stay tuned on that. Um, you are welcome to join the TRC meeting tomorrow. Um, as I said, the study is halfway through year two. Um, we did have some initial delays because of those data, getting CEI sensitive data from the ISOs um, after we overcame those challenges, the study uh, is largely um, back on track. We are still committed to complete all the technical analysis by the end of October and hopefully to get a draft report at the same time. Um, then if we are able to get through all the internal review process, which could take very long, uh, we, we are targeting end of the year uh, to release a final report to the public. So I'll skip, quickly skip this one and uh, uh, talk about some early results. So, um, so I just want to uh, let you know that we have been sharing those preliminary results over the past 18 months. So please bear with me if some of those contents may be repetitive to you. Uh, so the two scenarios have been identified that drive, that have uh, drove the analysis. One is the uh, business as usual, the other is low carbon. Uh, so the BAU scenario is the baseline that we use to compare um, uh, the low carbon scenarios. Uh, so the biggest differences of the two scenarios are the demand growth. And, uh, for, for the BAU, we assume pretty flat load growth, probably 1% or 1.3%, and low carbon scenarios because of the electrification future would be much higher load growth, which would warrant the need of more generations. The second difference is the carbon emission assumptions. So both scenarios assume the state policy 
state RPS standards, you know, or even the offshore wind uh, deployment goals. But for low carbon, uh, we look at this 80% carbon reduction in electricity sector by 2035. Uh, which you can see a little different from the Biden administration's 100% by 2035. We want to be a little more realistic and practical. And our 2050 carbon uh, reduction goal is 95% by 2050. The rest of the transmission assumptions remain um, unchanged between the two. So the results of those uh, of the uh, two scenarios is for low carbon scenario, um, we are going to deploy uh, at least 85 gigawatts of offshore wind in the Atlantic region. Um, so what's the breakdown of this 85 gigawatts? Um, so this, this slide just shows the breakdown, not just offshore wind, but also all uh, generation mix uh, in those four areas, uh, Carolina, New England, New York, and PGM. So the lower half, the lower right bottom of the table shows the offshore wind breakdown. Uh, so under the low carbon offshore scenarios, in IS, a New England region will see about 31 gigawatt of offshore wind. Um, the PGM is 23, New York 22, and uh, the last 10 gigawatt goes to the Carolinas. Then uh, how much uh, generation, how much electricity will be produced by those offshore wind? So this chart shows um, the generation output um, by all resources. You just take a look at the New England, um, I don't know how do I use <laughs> this one. All right, never mind. So the uh, New England, uh, the, the blue bar um, uh, shows the uh, offshore wind uh, generation, uh, electricity come out of the offshore wind. So just compare roughly, you can see in New England, 31 gigawatt offshore wind will pr produce more than 30% of total electricity for the New England region. That's a pretty big number. And uh, it's, that, that means um, offshore wind will be an important generation mix for the New, New England region. Um, other areas may see uh, different generation per, per, um, play a different role in their region, but overall a healthy diversified generation resource is critical for the grid to, to keep the uh, lights on. Um, as I just said, uh, we collected uh, more than 25 layers of um, sighting data um, for example, in this map, um, the spaghetti lines are the submarine cables. The green block um, in the, um, on the top is the uh, conservation area. The, the, the polygon line green represents the bone leasing area. We also have um, shipping lane in this bright colored line, uh, yellow line, and the, the picture also shows the ocean deposit site in black, various, uh, various sediments, and uh, some DOD uh, danger and exclusion zones. How do we utilize those sighting data? Um, we actually use that to drive our um, optimal transmission routing. Uh, the small algorithm is just, you know, given an offshore wind site, you find, um, you, you compare every single possible POIs along the coast and find the path that has the least resistance and uh, with the shortest length. So we were using this one um, to um, help drive the transmission routing so that um, the, the map in the end won't be just a straight point to point lines, but also, cur but a curved line that represents the places that we need to route the transmission around. So uh, now let's see some maps. So uh, the, we, uh, so far we have be able to spend most of our time working on identifying the optimal transmission, not optimal, but the various different transmission topologies. So we have studied five different ones. Two of them has been discussed at the um, public workshop earlier this year. So three of them are relatively new, pr pretty much free, uh, fresh off the print. So let me just go over them one by one. First, we call the radio. Uh, radio means um, by 2050, all um, offshore wind will be connected to onshore point, uh, onshore point of interconnection through just single line up. Um, this is probably counterfactual, um, but we want to use that as a base for comparison. Another number two topology is we call it intra-regional or within region. So that means we are going to connect, uh, create some meshed network within the planning regions. The third one is inter-regional, uh, where, we, where we identify a few places that can tie multiple regions together. 
and uh, the the fourth one is actually the interregional on top of intraregional. So we we use that approach ref to reflect what's going on with the industry. And the last one is more um, a, a backbone, which running all the way through uh, Maine to the um, uh, to the South Carolina. So the uh, before we dive into the uh, uh, the details of each one, I just want to give, let me spend a minute to explain how we select those um, interlinks uh, for interregions and uh, within our region. So this heat map here was produced by a production cost run um, under the assumption that all future off offshore grid will be connected re re through radio lines onshore. Uh, because of the transmission congestion, different nodes in the grid will have different prices. Um, so the best places to build transmission lines would be between those um, two nodes that has uh, the biggest price difference. By doing that, um, the grid will see uh, the, uh, the least, the maximum uh, production cost savings. So uh, this, uh, this heat map shows that the, the red box shows the areas that uh, has largest uh, um, price gaps. And we chose, we find nodes in between those, in those box to uh, build our uh, interlinks. That those links uh, has a great potential to um, maximize the production cost savings. So here are the two maps. The first one, left side, is a radio connection, which is no surprise. Uh, although we said it's counterfactual, we recognize that even in 2050, there might be still offshore wind connecting to uh, POI through radio connection on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, for the left side map, that's an uh, interregional network. We've seen those maps um, in, um, in the last workshop. So in this map, there were, we are we, are, we found three um, HVDC meshed network that connects uh, New York, New England, and the PGM together. They are colored differently so that they are, the three, three networks are independent to each other. There is a fourth one in the yellow color that connects um, PGM and uh, uh, North Carolina. Those interlinks are two gigawatt each. Uh, why, why we choose two gigawatt? That's because a lot of European countries are talking about standardized uh, HVDC connection and they pick two gigawatt as the default size. I know folks are still working uh, in, in Europe and trying to making that a, um, working on making that a real standards. For us, it's more like, you know, if our OEMs are ready to go two gigawatt, it's probably easier for US to adopt that. So the study assumes this to availability of two gigawatt on on subsea cables and the size of the HVDC uh, converters. So this map shows uh, on the left side is the interregional uh, uh, network option. The right side is we added a little bit of the intraregional lines. So the looks like very tiny. You can see on top of the uh, right figure, there's like a small tiny black line and a few of them around that and some are very short. So those are very short intra-regional lines. As I said, uh, you know, the intra-regional lines is an add-on to our inter-regional transmission topology because of the existing state, existing efforts in the industry, such as the New York mesh, mesh the network mesh ready design and the New England a joint state innovation partnership for offshore wind. So those intra-regional for New York and uh, um, PGM regions are mainly AC connection, but for New England, we choose the DC connection for the inter-regional lines. And the last set of map is also a comparison of inter-regional network versus a backbone. So for the backbone design, we added additional uh, separate uh, transmission cable, also two gigawatt. So add the, the two additional two gigawatt we'll be able to enable more uh, power to flow uh, between north and south, uh, carrying electricity not just generated by offshore wind, also by onshore uh, renewable resources. So um, we, are as we are going to share our production cost results of all five uh, topologies tomorrow, which we are, also, we are also going to share the benefit and cost ratios. And uh, the topologies um, 
just a, a spoiler alert. The topology that uh, has interregional links um, already shows comparative advantages um, in production cost savings. And uh, however, the, the selection of the best topology is really depends on uh, many factors. Uh, I think at the end of this DOE report, we're probably not going to, going to say this is a winning topology, but rather than uh, each topology has its pro and cons, it's really um, up to the individual organization to make their own choices. And uh, um, hopefully our work will be used to prepare and encourage ISRTOs uh, and other transmission planners to conduct their own studies. And also, uh, we, are, we are working on cost-benefit allocation analysis, and hopefully the information will enable more collaborative and uh, more collaboration and coordination between states and between regions. All right, that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Fu. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Josh Ganji. Am I going the wrong way? Okay. Uh, he, uh, let's see, Josh has been a renewable energy program specialist with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management since 2017. In this role, he's a project coordinator for the Federal Review of Wind Projects Offshore New England, New York, and the Mid-Atlantic. And he also works to develop Bureau policy on offshore wind transmission issues uh, prior to his time at BOEM, Josh worked uh, with NOAA in the, global, in the Global Environment Facility, and he holds a law degree from just north of here at NYU and a master's degree in environmental management from Yale University. And around OREP, he's familiarly, familiarly known as the transmission guy. So <laughs> uh, I'd like you to welcome Josh up. Excellent. Uh, th thank you, Wright, and, uh, and, and thank you, John, for uh, going over the, the study. I'm going to go a bit more into detail on the, uh, the planning efforts uh, behind sort of the siting and permitting of, of potential transmission to support off the offshore wind industry. So I wanted to start just by sort of setting the stage here uh, and the current state of offshore wind projects. Uh, as, as mentioned uh, earlier, I believe we, we've held 11, 11 competitive lease sales at this point and there are actively 27 leases. Um, I will say these numbers keep changing as more and more projects get to different stages throughout the project. Um, but th this really paints the picture of what we're talking about is how do you get this power to shore in an efficient manner and a way that meets the goals of the administration and the various states. And that it really is the state goals uh, that continue to drive um, the, the need for more offshore wind transmission planning as these numbers continue to, to increase um, and, and may already be out of date uh, as of this morning, uh, because I haven't checked the news. So I promise not to read the regulations to you at this point, but just wanted to make them available uh, for those that, that might be viewing this at a later date. Essentially what this says is our framework statute, the, the Outer Continental Land Shelf Act, um, requires the issuance of a lease for offshore wind uh, uh, generation on the outer continental shelf or a right-of-way grant um, for transmission that is independent of that lease. And so anyone wishing to build an offshore wind farm or the associated transmission uh, needs, to get a, needs to get a lease or a grant from, from BOEM. Again, there, there's sort of two paths here um, for those that might be new to the transmission space. Um, first, transmission is part of a lease. So any of our leases uh, that we issue come uh, by, per our regs for the right to one or more non-competitive easements to shore uh, for the purposes of transmission. Uh, there's also the option for the issuance of a right-of-way grant. Um, this would be done by either a third party or you know, the, the backbone system, the idea of connecting multiple projects uh, via an independent transmission system would likely use the right-of-way grant process. So I think one of the key points I want to highlight today is just the amount of coordination that it would take for transmission, uh, for transmission to be developed on the OCS. There's a number of players that, that touch the, uh, any of these projects uh, in lots of places. So uh, just highlighting a few here. Uh, one, the federal government. BOEM, as I mentioned, is sort of the landlord of the OCS, uh, making space available. FERC, uh, 
the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is, takes the, the, the framework statutes on how the, the grid is operated uh, at a nation level, nationwide level. And then, of course, federal permitting agencies that, that are required to issue specific permits for specific areas such as natural resources or C4 disturbance, for example. Number two, uh, the grid operators. The independent system operators and, and regional transmission operators, the ISOs, RTOs, play an important role in transmission planning and the operability of the grid at a regional level. Uh, any lessee is also looking to get a grid trans transmission study uh, from them to, that, that tells them what upgrades are needed to connect to the grid at the place uh, that they're selecting and what the costs for those upgrades would be. Uh, they also work with the states at a high level um, in order to incorporate those state goals into the, the forward-looking transmission planning strategies. And then also the state role, and, and it really is sort of, in the transmission space, it's, it's very hard to sort of, um, you know, uh, state how important the states are for a number of reasons. First, as I mentioned earlier, the renewable energy goals and legislation that, that mandate use of, of, of offshore wind or transmission-specific issues um, play an enormous role in being able to dictate what exactly they want. Um, so they can condition these offtake agreements for specific purposes. Also, the, uh, the state utilities uh, may play a role there. And uh, there are also property interests in, in landfall uh, location points, for example. In addition, they're required to, uh, in any easement or right-of-way grant that Boehm is issuing on the OCS, uh, by necessity, has to go through state waters and on, on state land. So there has to be some sort of agreement that these are good ideas. So just uh, I wanted to highlight a, a sort of non-exhaustive list of some of the considerations that are used to, to evaluate the siting of uh, transmission uh, on the OCS. First, uh, our Ox OXLA uh, requirements require a number of things, but prevention of waste of the resource, um, conservation of natural resources of the OCS, protection of the environment are just a few. In addition, Boehm's always looking to minimize conflicts ahead of time with other ocean users uh, and sensitive areas. So a number, of, a number of issues come into play when we're evaluating potential routing. Um, as was mentioned, I think, earlier today, the, the NEPA process also requires a number of consultations to, to really evaluate the potential impacts of any project. Uh, Boehm's also issued offshore wind cable spacing guidance that, that has a role in helping determine how to place cables. Uh, and then I wanted to just do a shout out also to the Marine Cadaster and the Ocean Data Portals that are you know, here today that, that provide a lot of that information in a, in a graphic interface uh, for people to take a look at if you want to try your hand at, uh, at ocean planning. So as I was getting at earlier, really there's a number of reasons why this alignment with state and regional initiatives are, are incredibly important uh, for, for transmission. Um, as I mentioned, there is a, a planned approach requires close coordination with the states. Um, you know, the, the continuance of the right-of-ways, also um, all of ensuring that their, their needs are met. And there's a timing piece here, too, as you wouldn't want to have stranded assets, meaning that a wind farm, is, a wind project is developed but doesn't have transmission to get it to shore in place. Um, so, so the timing piece of making sure that if you're having independent transmission systems in place, uh, that, that they're ready to go when, when generation is there. So let's say an offshore wind uh, backbone has been built offshore. Uh, the, the lessee would then have an easement, for example, to the existing offshore transmission uh, infrastructure offshore instead of coming to shore. And then also the, the RTOs and ISOs uh, do a lot of advanced planning uh, to, to be able to incorporate uh, offshore wind into the, the regional grids, so making sure that um, you know, those are all aligned is another piece of this. So that being said, what are we doing? Um, so Boehm has taken a number of steps already to try and incorporate some of these things into our lease conditions and into uh, the, the, the tools that we have. Um, for example, both the New York Bight and uh, California final seal notices stated that Boehm could condition construction operations plans on the use of cable corridors, regional systems, mesh systems, and other mechanisms, shared infrastructure where appropriate. Um, we also inc started including stipulations requiring the seeking of input from tribal nations and other ocean users prior to proposing easements to BOEM. Uh, this is just to ensure that, that they're really doing their due diligence um, in, in the outreach department. 
Uh, we also started introducing workforce and supply chain development bidding credits in some of our auctions as it's well recognized that the development of the supply chain for transmission infrastructure and the workforce needed in the country to install this uh, needs to develop rapidly. Someone I believe earlier also mentioned the communications plan requirements. Uh, again, uh, the, the tribal communications plans, the agency communications plans, fisheries liaisons, um, you know, we're, we're really trying to, to deconflict as much as possible up front that way. And then also the incorporation of state requirements. Um, so if a state has a mesh requirement or is, is uh, asking for a transmission specific issue, uh, we need to make sure that those are incorporated into the construction and operations plans uh, as those projects are developed. Then also wanted to just mention the, the, uh, the NOI for the, uh, the programmatic EIS for the New York bite. Uh, we're looking there to, to bring in uh, some, some transmission analysis into, into the programmatic level. So now uh, move to our, our planning effort with DOE. Uh, John uh, covered part of it uh, uh, quite well earlier, but this is an ongoing effort, uh, or a joint effort between the Department of Energy and BOEM over the last couple of years to really take a holistic look at transmission planning um, and making sure that we're, we're using sort of an all government approach here. So the idea here is to be able to meet the goals and also do this in a way that maximizes the points of interconnection while minimizing uh, environmental harm and conflicts with other ocean users. And so a number of efforts were launched here. Um, the, the study that John covered, um, the, the scoping and analysis, the, um, the study technical assistance, and really what we're getting at is eventually a final recommendations report, an action plan that we're expecting later this year. I'll go into a bit more detail uh, over the next couple of slides. So the, the scoping discussions we kicked off in June and all through August of 2021, um, I think we held over 20 calls uh, with uh, very issue specific uh, types covering federal agencies, uh, NGOs, developers, public utility commissions, uh, regional coordinators, transmission operators, uh, tribal groups, unions, utilities, fisheries, um, just to, to get make sure that if we were developing a larger plan, that all issues that needed to be considered were, were adequately discussed and, and thought about. So we took the results of those, uh, of those scoping calls to develop thematic transmission convening workshops that were held over the last uh, year or so. Um, so th those covered topics including you know, the planning and development, the stakeholder partnership issues, siting and permitting, economics and policy, technical issues. Um, and we held essentially about one a month for the last year. Um, and as you see on the, on the little chart there, where we are, um, we're, we're, we held our last sort of public workshop where we went into great detail, our decent detail on the recommendations uh, in draft form uh, last March. I believe that recording is available online if you would like to hear me and others talk in great detail on this uh, at a later date. Um, and the recommendations report again will be coming out um, uh, in the near future. So just uh, uh, you know, what's in this action plan and, and development uh, and uh, recommendations report, I uh, just wanted to highlight a few things, non-exhaustive again. So some of the things that we definitely heard were that um, there needed to be options for transmission infrastructure siting that were sort of um, not necessarily predetermined, but were, were analyzed uh, to the best of the ability. So something along the concept of preferred routes being identified by, by, this, uh, by us. And that could be supported by a request for competitive interest, which is sort of the first stop, stop in the BOEM planning process. Uh, another thing was that there needed to be an intergovernmental partnership body that really guided the development of transmission. Um, so one, you know, transmission task force, if you will, that, that brings together federal, tribal, state, local actors to discuss specific proposals. Also, there is a need for increased regulatory guidance, so discussing the process and timing for sort of these more complex shared transmission scenarios that haven't gotten through the regulatory process uh, that, that, say, an individual project for an offshore wind breeze has. Also looking into standardization for equipment. Um, needs for continued research and development to move the industry forward, and then also funding mechanisms for tribal, state, and local government initiatives to really make sure we're incorporating uh, those needs into the process. 
and again, leveraging the, the RTOs and planners for the systematic evaluation of points of interconnection as it is somewhat of a moving target as you add new capacity and, and other old capacity comes out of the grid. And then a, a desire to look at uh, ways to improve the cost allocation methodology. This is, is, you know, who pays for this infrastructure and who owns it. So with that, um, you know, happy to, to partake in this discussion that, that we're having today and, uh, and uh, appreciate being here. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I would like to introduce our third speaker who is partici participating virtually, Dr. Kira Lawrence. Let's hopefully our people in the booth can get... Good afternoon. Can get her up here in a, in a minute. They've been, they've been great, thanks. Um, uh, she's gonna give us an overview of the types of studies that states can use, uh, stakeholder involvement and lessons learned. Dr. Kira Lawrence is a senior scientist with the Clean Energy Division at the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities, serving as the environmental lead for the BPU's offshore wind program. Her duties include serving as the BPU's point person for the offshore wind research and monitoring initiative and on the BPU's team to implement coordinated transmi transmission through state agreement approach. Dr. Lawrence is an earth and environmental scientist with expertise in, client, in climate and ocean sciences. She holds an undergraduate degree from Dartmouth College, master's degrees from the University of uh, California, Santa Cruz and Brown University with a PhD from Brown University. Uh, prior to her work with the BPU, Dr. Lawrence spent more than a decade in academia as a professor at Lafayette College, serving as both the co-chair of the environmental programs and as chair of the Department of Geology and Environmental Sciences. Uh, Kira, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Hopefully you can hear me. Yes, yes. yes. okay. And I take it I'm supposed to share my screen because I can't see my slides up. Let me just get that sorted here. Okay, can you see my slides? Can someone confirm you can see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for participating today. Um, I am pleased to be here and uh, offer this presentation on behalf of the BPU. Um, as Wright just noted, I work for the Clean Energy Division of the state government in New Jersey. And I'm gonna talk today about New Jersey's coordinated transmission efforts, which we have and are continuing to pursue through a mechanism in the PJM tariff called the state agreement approach. Just as a high-level high overview of New Jersey's offshore wind program, our overall goal is 11 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2040. We are already on our way towards that goal through our first two solicitations. The first solicitation awarded a project to Ocean Wind One uh, in a 1.1 gigawatt project in 2019. And then the second solicitation awarded two projects, one to Ocean Wind Two and another to Atlantic Shores in uh, 2021. And they total together about 2.6 gigawatts. So in aggregate, we're north of uh, 3.7 gigawatts. All of uh, both of these solicitations, all of these projects have what we call a bundled approach to transmission. So each project is responsible for both their generation and the necessary transmission um, to bring those electrons ashore. Those are included in the OREC. On the left of this slide is a map of existing lease areas in the New York Bight. The green and light blue closest to shoreline, those lease areas are where our currently awarded projects are. And then you see the new lease areas off to the north and east of there. Um, the picture on the right depicts one hypothetical uh, way of interconnecting these projects to New Jersey. And as you can see, this could potentially be very complex with respect to transmission. So this bundled approach has some significant limitations. So with this challenge of the bundled approach in mind, New Jersey has sought to uh, employ a coordinated approach um, and try and find a, a coordinated way to bring these projects ashore uh, and get that ele electricity ashore in an efficient man manner. So to do that, we needed to work with our RTO, uh, PJM, uh, who's, who's responsible for being the RTO for New Jersey and, and the, many other mid-Atlantic states. Um, a big part of their 
uh, directive is to plan the enhancement and expansion of transmission capability on a regional basis. And they do this for, through something called the RTEP, their Regional Transmission Expansion Planning Process. Um, typically that is driven by need and cost, but alternatively, the PJM tariff also allows an option for states to request the inclusion of their public policy goals into the RTEP. And uh, that is only if the state agrees to pay the full cost of whatever uh, upgrades are selected through this process called the state agreement approach, which I'm gonna reference as the SAA from uh, moving forward. So in November, 2020, the BPU requested that PJM include its offshore wind public policy goal. At that time, the, our goal was seven and a half gigawatts into the PJM RTEP process. So this slide just sort of summarizes in a visual format what I just said. In previous solicitations, so that's the figure on the left-hand side, solicitations one and two, we took this bundled approach where uh, both the generation and the transmission were included in the OREC price. Under the SAA, those transmission costs are taken out of the OREC and handled through the normal RTEP cost allocation methodology. And then the, the state uh, agrees to pay for 100% of those, those cost upgrades. So the goal is to bring um, the future OREC prices down to reflect the cost of just the generation and use the SAA to place the transmission where we think it appropriately belong belongs within the PJM RTEP process. So bundled is what we've had historically with the SAA. We're going to unbundle transmission from generation, um, and I'm going to re reference those words um, as we move forward here. Okay, so New Jersey's state agreement approach goals broadly were to encourage competition, lower the cost and risk of offshore wind generation and transmission, maximize transmission developer expertise, really lean into folks who have done transmission historically, lower our OREC price, um, because in the OREC price, transmission is usually a, a big wild card historically, and minimize environmental permitting and fisheries impacts. And by that, we mean uh, minimize the number of cable crossings to shore and minimize the points of interconnection. So uh, BPU staff work with PJM and also our consultant, the Brattle Group, to develop a solicitation. Uh, this is through the RTEP. The window opened in April of 2021. It closed in September of 2021. And uh, under this policy, even though PJM is facilitating the process, B BPU is the ultimate decision maker about whether or not any uh, projects proceed to construction and those that do which of those projects pro proceed to construction. So our SAA uh, solicitation requested four distinct options. Option one is onshore upgrades shown in the green here. So existing substations have a little brown circle, or sorry, black circle around them. New substations, sometimes called reach circuits. In our process, we called them 1B, option 1Bs, um, reach the transmission grid towards the shoreline. And then option two are uh, projects that would extend the grid offshore, crossing the beach and out towards and into the into the ocean to offshore, including offshore substations. And then option threes is linking multiple projects together. Um, we call this a backbone. This is probably a mini version of the backbone that you've heard referred to in the two previous talks. We had a really robust response to our um, SAA uh, RTEP solicitation. 13 bidders with 80 proposals. This is just a, a quick table to summarize all the different proposals and all the different bidders. Um, but we were pleased with the creative, novel, and competitive bids that we received and with the overall really robust response that we got. We evaluated the proposals uh, based upon those overarching SAA goals uh, that I enumerated a few minutes ago, and also based upon a baseline scenario that we created which was our best estimate of what things would look like under the status quo. So under that bundled approach that I described earlier. So um, all that together, uh, in addition to reflecting our SAA goals through our evaluation criteria. And so I just enumerated the, these here on the bottom portion of the slide. So you have a sense of, of what we measured against. So cost, constructability, environmental impact, so on and so forth. So in evaluating our results, I'm gonna talk through what, where we landed. Um, at the conclusion of our analysis, we determined that we were not gonna move forward with an option two proposal because we decided that the benefits um, did not uh, outweigh the costs. So this is a reminder, the, the option twos are those that, that extend 
the transmission out across the shoreline to offshore substations. So I think there are a number of uh, potential there are myriad ways in which uh, option twos we found were limiting, but I'm just gonna highlight a few of the major ones. And there were some technological in, uh, limitations. So in the designs that we received, we didn't. Uh, they would have connected only a single project to each offshore substation. They would not have gathered multiple projects um, to go into a single transmission line to shore. Second, um, when we were doing the evaluation, it was the assessment of our team that the federal investment tax credit would not apply to transmission that was developed by a transmission developer, but it would apply to transmission that was um, developed by a, an offshore wind generator. So that's a pretty big delta in the cost of uh, this uh, op these option twos. And third, the unbundling of offshore wind transmission and generation, we uh, stepped up the project on project risk because the generators would be reliant on transmission developers to be able to get their electrons to shore. And they, they only um, get OREX if their electrons get to the POI. So there was a non-trivial concern about project and project risk expressed during our stakeholdering process um, that we also found was uh, potentially a, a big problem. We also did not select any option three proposals in part because the benefits didn't outweigh the cost there either, but also because uh, these are linked to the selection of an op option two and having decided not to select an option two, uh, option three was not on the table anymore. However, we did find that option one proposals, those that were onshore upgrade only did have merit and the uh, enormous benefits associated with them. So we found that they were significantly less expensive relative to the status quo. And that again is tied to our baseline analysis that um, there were benefits of our, our um, of an enabling a single POI and that you know there would be a single plot to, to plug in and that that would allow us to think about a common transmission cable route. Um, we also think that these increased competition in future OREX solicitations because transmission tends to be a non-trivial wire wild card associated with the OREC price and by having a, a defined plug whose cost is certain that uh, helps us have a better sense of what the final OREC prices would be. And uh, finally, this allows us to limit onshore transmission routes. And I'll talk to more, more about that in a minute. So we landed on um, the board selected in October of 2022, something we call the Larrabee Tri-Collector Solution, which will produce a new substation and adjacent land to allow converter stations from future offshore wind projects to plug into the grid. And they're also associated with what we called in the um, RTEP, option 1A upgrades, those are for existing substation upgrades to allow the injection of um, all of the offshore wind up to that 7,500 7, megawatt um, target into the grid. The cost associated with this collective solution, so the new substation, the land and all those um, existing substation upgrades was $1.2 billion for this full solution. But the estimate relative to the baseline scenario was that we would be saving ratepayers $900 million by taking this coordinated approach. One of the major goals of New Jersey's state agreement approach was to try and minimize the cable routes um, and the disruptions that they would cause of so environmental impacts, community impacts, and potential de delays to the project. But uh, the, the selection of the SA itself, right, this new substation, the adjacent land that we talked about, what we're calling the LCS, it doesn't get us there in and of itself uh, because each developer, so you can see in the figure on the right here, the more left-hand part of it, um, would require that that uh, offshore wind developer get from their wind farm to that POI that we have designated at Larrabee uh, Tri-Collector. So what we sought to do is uh, a novel concept that we have called the pre-build, which uh, in essence, selects a generator as part of our third solicitation, which is um, on the street right now, to build all the necessary unenergized infrastructure for its project, and then also for future projects from shore to this POI. And that allows us to achieve this other major goal that we had associated with the SAA, which is to try and reduce the number of shore crossings and uh, cable routes um, uh, across New Jersey. So that's a good summary of our um, SAA process and how we sought to couple it with um, our third solicitation. 
we think the merits of coordinated transmission are significant. And so uh, just last month, the BPU's board approved the initiation of a second SAA request with PJM. And this seeks to get us to a coordinated transmission solution that allows us to interconnect our capacity, the additional capacity, which is uh, 3.5 gigawatts that would get us up to the 11 gigawatt goal that we now have. Um, that goal was established in September of 2022 and the first SAA concluded in October. So uh, there wasn't really any way to, to get to that goal in the first SAA. The second SAA, um, here are some of the major highlights. Staff has recommended that PJM plan to do injections at the Dean substation, the 500 KV station, but also allow some flexibility for bidders to propose alternative points of inter interconnection. It's got the same options as SAA 1.0. It will not impact um, previous awards, awarded projects or any of those that are up to that 7.5 gigawatt goal that, it, that um, was basically satisfied by the first SAA. And it recommends continued discussion with other East Coast states um, to try and gauge interest in a coordinated regional transmission solution. And I think that dovetails actually um, nicely with, with the, some of the things said in the prior two talks. So um, here are my future points. It, it was uh, heartening to see Josh sort of end in a, in a similar space. Um, we think regional coordination is absolutely critical if we're going to get to this 30 gigawatt and beyond goal that is, is already materializing along the eastern seaboard. Um, we are hopeful that federal funding and the clarity about federal funding available for transmission will um, uh, materialize soon. And I, my understanding is that um, that's on the horizon here. Uh, underscoring the needs for standards, because right now each state is pr proceeding with their own procurement process. And I think New Jersey and New York are good examples of uh, having an eye towards the need for coordination, but also, um, you know, it, each of us has our own our own effort. And it's not clear that this sort of piecemeal approach to uh, transmission, that we're necessarily going to be able to connect all, all those things in the future. Uh, similarly, just as Josh noted, there's a role for technological advancements that would help um, ad advance coordinated transmission. And I'll just land, land on, I think there are some major issues of governance um, that need to be thought about in a very deliberate way. Who owns what, um, you know, where's the POI, all manner of other questions that really, I think, merit uh, some deep thought about a, a community that's trying to get us to coordinated transmission. So I, I'll stop there. I'll, I thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to the Q&A. Thanks, Kira. Uh, that was fantastic. I, um, I've actually been watching the, the, B, the BPU's process, the stated, stated process for a long time because it's, um, I, I really think it's, you, New Jersey's shown some real leadership on the on the thinking ahead in, uh, in transmission. Uh, okay, we're gonna do, that, that sums up the first part. We're going to, uh, I've got a question that I'd like each of our first sections panelists to address. So everybody has to listen. <laughs> um, so it has to do with studies. How do federal and state transmission studies get incorporated into offshore wind energy transmission planning, procurement, and development phases? I can repeat the question. I feel like a game show host. <laughs> uh, let's start with you, Jen. Uh, I think you probably know that DOE does not, authority, does not have the authority to do transmission planning. So DOE is more like a convening organization than an R&D organization. So for, for my perspective, our study is really um, to be able to convene a lot of stakeholders through our TRC uh, body of, we have probably more than 100 TRC members from various different organizations, utilities, industries, ISO, RTOs. So uh, be able to get their input and uh, for them to review our data, review our results. And uh, I think through that effort, we're able to interact with them, inform them of them of what the future scenario would look like and, uh, and encourage them to take our results and study, conduct their own studies, hopefully through that process that can move the needle a little faster and get them um, engaged and involved into the future transmission process and considering shell transmission and considering more coordination and collaboration. Thank you. Um, 
the DOE may not have a direct role in the transmission planning process, but I will say that the studies that they uh, th that they produce uh, set the tone for a lot of the rest of the discussion that hap that's happening. And I think the current study that we're all waiting for at the end of the year is going to be one of those landmarks uh, that really helps helps the, solve these problems. Uh, Josh. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say that um, you know one of the key roles of, or one of the key assumptions of the DOE, the joint effort with DOE for transmission planning, was that we wanted to make sure that we weren't sort of preempting uh, the state role and really trying to, to find ways to make sure that we are incorporating, uh, you know, the, the, the great work that the states have been doing and and the RTOs are already doing, uh, and, and really incorporate that knowledge into the overall planning effort. Uh, you know, John mentioned uh, the the way that the, the TRC is, is leveraging this. Uh, we, we also, you know, worked with the states in, in the scoping calls and, and all of the workshops uh, have, have a heavy state presence to make sure that, that we were really understanding, uh, you know, what had been done and what needed to be done going forward. Um, sort of from, a, from an operative level, um, you know, any of the state requirements that, that go into their procurements uh, would be in, incorporated into sort of the construction and operations plan uh, and, and federal review process as well. Um, so, uh, like I said, making sure that, that we're, we're all on the same page uh, from, from the beginning, I think, it, it is critical. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, anything to add? Yeah, i just say um, I, I'm really looking forward to the report that, that um, Gian and, and uh, Josh were talking about coming available at the end of the year. You know, I think it, that will actually help states at significantly advanced state efforts. Um, so just want to footnote just how important I think that effort and uh, the results of it will be to advancing uh, coordinated transmission. The other thing I would say, you know, on a different scale, the tra transmission studies that we had a very close relationship with PJM and with our consultant Brattle group to get to the SAA outcome that we did. And, you know, there were non-trivial amount of transmission studies happening in that collaborative process that very directly informed the outcome of the SAA for us. And so for, for us on a state level, this, uh, this opportunity to work closely with our RTO and, um, you know, kind of, I'd say, put a foundational block on the, on the, and so hopefully a cornerstone block in, in the effort to think about this down, uh, absolutely intimately informed by transmission studies um, but, you know, I, I guess I want to come back to the point I was making at the beginning of, of, of this comment, which is we have to figure out how those different pieces that are going to be laid by different states get put together. Um, and I think, you know, coordination by the federal government or recommendations by the, the, by the federal government, these, this report that's coming out, I think will be very instrumental in helping us, you know, really move the ball. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think... There's, there's a, kind of a, a shared recognition of the importance on the part of the federal government of the importance of the states and, if it, and vice versa. I think everybody understands that there's a lot of, a lot of people who need to uh, align in order to make all this work. Um, all right. I, first of all, thank you for the first three panelists. I think they did a great job. Thank you. Stay, stay here. We're not going anywhere yet. Um, but uh, I'd like to introduce, we have two speakers uh, uh, for, to provide some industry perspectives. Uh, Laura uh, Smith-Morton is a partner at per, uh, Perkins Coie, who's here with us. And uh, Jennifer Garvey, the head of the New York uh, Market Strategy for Orsted, uh, who will be joining remotely as well. Um, we're going to hear from Laura Morton first. Uh, Laura is a partner at the DC office of Perkins Coie LLP. She advises clients on the environmental review and permitting required for onshore and offshore wind solar, environmental review permitting required for onshore and offshore wind solar, electric transmission and water resource projects and navigating government regulatory review. Laura also works with her clients to identify opportunities for government funding uh, of their clean energy and manufacturing projects, including those emerging from the Inflation Reduction Act and Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Laura previously served as the Senior Director of Policy and Regulatory Affairs at, for Offshore Wind at American Clean Power, where her portfolio covered a wide range of issues surrounding the offshore wind leasing and permitting processes, 
and multiple use compatibility in the ocean environment, including commercial fishing, wildlife, and other marine uh, resources, transmission and development of strategies to elevate issues surrounding environmental justice and delivery of benefits to underserved communities. Prior to ACP, Laura spent seven years uh, in the federal government, in, in federal government roles, including as Deputy Chief of Staff at NOAA, Deputy Associate Director for Change and Energy at CEQ, and Senior Advisor to the Secretary of Energy. I will turn it over to Laura for her remarks uh, to include some context about community benefit agreements. So I was threatening right before with having to read a really long bio and figure out how, and he did a very good job, so thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna completely switch gears here and not talk about transmission studies, but talk about potential impacts to communities um, that offshore transmission could have. Um, so I could start with a poll of the audience, which I'm not gonna make you do, but to wake you up a little bit to think about what communities might be concerned about um, when they think about offshore wind projects. Now, mind you, this is a very random sampling um, of different environmental impact statement and of analyses and reports that have been out there um, and you know media. Um, and these are just honestly a few. Uh, but needless to say, you know, what Kira and what Jen and Josh were talking about with just the landfall alone. Um, and thinking about that hit, so where the transmission cables come to shore and what that's going to impact, it's going to be on properties. Um, it could be uh, disruptive to a visual environment if we were thinking about something, on, you know, overhead. Um, burying cable, the issues there. Uh, beach restoration, if you have a resort community, the concern is this is going to come in and interrupt the businesses and tourism. Um, obviously, construction uh, maintenance repairs. Um, and then there are other questions that folks have raised about health effects from electromagnetic fields, um, underground cable safety, and of course we can't forget if we're talking more offshore, but even onshore fishing impacts. Um, and one thing that is not here that is absolutely critical, um, we heard the earlier panel talking about tribal data, um, but if you think about the tribes and indigenous communities, um, we have environmental justice communities too, um, and all the potential impacts on those folks. So the question then becomes, what are potential solutions um, for these type of community impacts? Um, and so the topic for today that I was asked to, um, to speak to were, was, what are community benefit agreements? Now, I think we have to recognize up front that community benefit agreements are not the first step. Uh, the first step is heavy early engagement with communities. Um, but that could lead to these type of negotiations for something called a community benefit agreement. So I'm gonna start with a quick overview and then talk about the benefits and the values engagement and then wrap up with um, what DOE and BOEM have been doing. So as a starting point, again, this a CBA, I'm gonna call them that for, for ease of reference. Um, funding agreements, they're signed by a community group or a coalition um, and the project developer. Um, and again, I'm talking about this broadly with offshore wind and offshore transmission, but CBAs are very common um, in other circumstances with a lot of other types of energy technologies. Um, a CBA would outline the benefits, monetary uh, or indirect benefits that a developer could provide to the community. It allows the communities to identify what benefits they want and their relationship to projects. Um, and something, of course, that's very important right now to the administration, um, to states and others, are the um, environmental justice I already mentioned before. How can this be, can be an effective tool to assist communities um, and other stakeholders that are impacted by projects? Um, and the other thing is, you know, CBAs can include specifically, I'll just throw out a couple examples, um, workforce training and apprenticeships for EJ communities, for tribes, for other groups where these uh, cables are gonna land. Um, some procurement requirements, there could be social needs, um, housing, healthcare, and others. Um, now, admittedly, I wanna tell everybody that a lot of what I have here on the next couple of slides have come from Department of Energy's Office of Ability Minority. Um, it's an economic development office, maybe, I mean, is that correct, John? Yes, 
I have to get the, exactly the, the right uh, title. But at any rate, a lot of this has come from Department of Energy, who has done a lot of research into opportunities um, for these types of CBAs. So I have pulled a lot of that from here. Um, but the values that the CBAs can promote, um, we've got the high level with inclusiveness, enforceability, transparency, coalition building, efficiency, and clarity of outcomes. Glad that we have a screen that can actually project the smaller text. Um, but a big issue, again, with these projects is that communities may have, um, the, the government or developers may have meetings that they just hold, right? They go out, they may have a community meeting, but sometimes you can say you are providing listening sessions, but it's not clear that communities are being heard. So that's always a really critical piece to have that interchange. Um, and so the CBAs could promote that type of inclusiveness. Um, this is particularly um, important for historically underrepresented community members who could be missing in the development process. So that's a way of promoting these agreements. Um, enforceability, if you have an agreement, these are typically legally enforceable. So it's a two-way street, um, which is an important piece of the puzzle too. Uh, transparency, a CBA will help you monitor how the projects are doing and what outcome it is. Um, public community groups, state and local officials. It builds alliances between community groups and among others that have different issues rather than just having one louder community group. You could have a partnership, early negotiation, and making sure that you have a clarity of outcomes. And you know, the other thing we have found, I mentioned the public hearings, um, they're not necessarily neighborhood friendly. They aren't necessarily going in to identify um, where the communities are. Somebody on the last panel said you need to go, or maybe it was the very beginning of the day, we've had great panels, um, but to go where the people are. Right, you can't expect people to come to you, so it's a matter of actually going out and having those engagements, and CBAs can promote those too. Um, benefits of a CBA. Um, certainly there's a benefit for a developer that if you have these agreements, then you will be more likely to have public support for your projects, that's fairly typical. Um, it would reduce the risk for a developer. Most of these projects is critical to have, um, well, I'm just gonna call it broad stakeholder. So you have stakeholder and then separately tribal government and other um, support. If you have that stakeholder support, we can use California as a really, this is, I realize we're on the East Coast, but I'm just thinking California because we have these conversations a lot. Um, but if you don't have the agreement of the people on the ground, your project is not gonna go through. through. So it's really important to have that um, support. Um, sometimes you could get state subsidies local subsidies or approval. Um, it's also a way to disseminate information, these conversations. And then the community benefits, again, you have an opportunity to have real community input into the project. So it's not just a statement, but it's actually like, we're gonna actually have a conversation about this. Sustainable commitments, hiring commitments, I mentioned that earlier, workforce, um, and Josh just talked about workforce and supply chain. It's really important to have that trained workforce so that can be a mechanism where the developer could actually provide some workforce training opportunities, um, educational partnerships, and support for businesses. Um, I, I'm, I'm somebody who has way too many words on slides, but I was told I could have a certain number of slides and then I had more information and so I just threw everything on one slide, but luckily you'll be provided these later. Uh, but I was trying to put the beginning engagement with everything up here. Um, Josh promised not to read regulations. I promise I will not read this entire slide. Um, but biggest point, I said, developers, you have to engage the people early. You have to identify them first, go early and often. Um, it can't just be one set of stakeholders. You have to make sure that the project briefings are um, engaged early, that's the key state and local government officials. Um, the other thing that's really important, I think, in these offshore wind projects is you can't expect everybody to understand what a project actually is. What do these things look like? How do they operate? What is the business model? You know, again, it's all the technology. All of us have been working in this industry for a long time. I mean, I've known Wright Harsh, Harsh since 2009. He and I have been doing this together. Josh and I worked together at NOAA, you know, eight years ago, and many people, but 
It's still taking us this long, right? And we were just talking over lunch. It takes a really long time to understand the industry. So certainly if you have communities and you're gonna be bringing cable to shore or have the projects, you can't expect everybody to understand this. So it's really important, again, to have this education. Um, and that, I think, ultimately could lead to something to successful um, community benefit agreement. Um, the communities have the opportunity through these to research proposals, have a coalition of community interests, hold public meetings, um, now I'm reading, uh, multiple communication mechanisms, again, active dialogue, and then the state and local governments, this is an opportunity for them really to have that conversation with the folks in their community and talk to the, talk to the developers. What are the real benefits that you could provide? Um, so that was all, again, just this broad framework that I promised, which is a lot of information, and I know we're going to have the slides that will be provided later. Um, but I wanted to turn quickly just to the two agencies that are key here and at the table, as a matter of fact. Um, so going to Department of Energy, now this isn't directly related to what we're talking about right now with offshore transmission, but I did think it's really important because the Biden-Harris administration is focusing very heavily um, on environmental justice, bringing benefits to the community, bringing jobs. Um, so that's a heavy focus. Congress has followed on with that. Yes, we're all working um, in sync here, but with the Inflation Reduction Act um, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, any funding that goes into DOE, the DOE is delivering through its grants and they have billions of dollars, must have a community benefit agreement as part of the application. So anybody who gets money has got to have something in place. Um, as I mentioned, it's, America, it's uh, the administration's focus um, primarily from the Justice 40 initiative, and I've got a link here. Um, it's engagement with a number of local stakeholders, again, that are important. We've got unions, we've got local governments and tribal governments and community-based organizations. It's supposed to be these CBAs are intentionally flexible. So again, when I say funding on all fronts, this could be for renewable energy projects, it could be for transmission, it's for manufacturing, it's for batteries. All of these um, projects are gonna be in different places with different needs. So that's something that has to be taken into account. Um, and then again, for energy related projects, it could be something like establishing a development fund. So again, we were chatting over lunch about funds and what does that look like for one of these projects. Could it be a CBA under DOE, but funds could be used um, elsewhere. Switching gears, now to BOEM. So BOEM has actually used CBAs um, in two auctions, 2015 and 2022, so very far apart. Again, I'm pointing to the gentleman on my left, right, who knows about the first Massachusetts lease auction where CBAs were included. Um, they were included with a bidding credit, so the millions that are going, less millions at that time, into um, auction, the auctions and getting a lease, 10% bidding credit could be provided for an executed CBA. So something that was actually signed and legally executed. Um, and so you'll see the description before, community-based organizations um, and a bidder. And I'm gonna show you, the next slide is going to show you about that bidder. But then we're gonna switch to California years later. A lot of discussions in California um, and a lot of advocacy to have community benefit agreements, again, be part of the lease um, auction. That did not happen for a long time. There were a lot of proposals along the way that we would start using these multi-factor auctions and bring community benefit agreements, but not until the 2022, December 22, California auction did this happen. And there were two possibilities that you could have for a CBA. You could have something which is a lease area use. Again, I'm not gonna read it, but it's 5%, unlike the 10. Um, and it's focused on the actual lease area. So the impacts to the geographic space of the lease area, far offshore, um, or the resources that were harvested. So think a lot about the fishing communities. So that's a little bit more focused. And then you had a general one, which was also 5%. Mind you, you could get both. Um, and that was lease developments that weren't other, well, otherwise addressed by the CBA. So that would you know, go back to, again, the coastal communities. There could be a lot of other impacts onshore that were slightly different. So those were two options. Now, 
It is unclear what will happen next. We have the Gulf of Mexico lease auction has just come out, um, and Boehm has proposed in that case um, contributions to a fund, and it's for fishing, and Wright can you know, make sure that he can nod and say this is correct. Um, but it's for a fishing one, it's not the same. It's a different type of approach. And I remember I said originally Massachusetts was an executed agreement. California was a commitment for a, an agreement. So there was a little bit more flexibility there. Um, and in the transmission study, they also talked about, this is a longer term goal. Again, I'm, I'm looking at Josh because I remember looking way down his slide deck that you can see online. But that is something that Boehm is recommending too, is trying to figure out some kind of recommendation for a community benefit agreement. Not necessarily as a credit, but something that we should see. Um, now, my last two, we're almost done. So, the examples that I was talking about. Um, just so you know, I am not here on behalf of Vineyard. I took this straight from their website. We're looking at what they did from the very beginning. This is the one I talked about when I had the earlier Massachusetts um, auction. So, Vineyard Wynn entered into the first federally recognized CVA. And I said apparently the 2051 auction, so apparently, you know, this is really long, far away, or it's actually 2015 and I just wrote it incorrectly, um, which we will change before I distribute this. Um, but the goal of this CVA was to have value through local job creation um, in the construction of an uh, O&M facility in this harbor. Uh, and since that, there's been Vineyard Power, with whom Vineyard Wind signed the CBA, has been involved in day-to-day -day operations. Um, and then on the right-hand side, it's just a screenshot of the actual CBA. And then the last slide, um, this is the second piece of this puzzle, which is not specifically a CBA, but it's a host community agreement. On the right-hand side, this is what Vineyard Wind has agreed to do. So no new development, water protections, off-season construction, figuring out benefits for beachgoers, protecting the cables, financial support, fairly significant. And this is a host community payment. And then collaborating on the project design. So while not precisely a community benefits agreement, you know, the, the term, this is what developers are doing. This is just one example of what investments that the developers are trying to make into the communities to make sure we have that collaboration. Um, collaboration, there you go. So I think, I know that Wright is gonna introduce Jen, but so I started with Vineyard and then we're gonna pivot. So we're gonna have Ersta talk you know, more about what they're focused on. Thanks, Laura. Uh, you handled my transition for me. <laughs> uh, we're going to hear from uh, Jennifer Garvey right now. She is the head of New York Market Strategy for Orsted. Um, she leads the government and community relations for two projects in New York, South Fork Wind, the state's first offshore wind project, and Sunrise Wind. Both projects have ex executed community benefit agreements, which Jennifer played a central role in developing. Before the, joining the offshore wind industry in 2017, Jennifer worked in the land conservation community, town government, and co-founded a water technology center at Stony Brook University. So I will turn it over to Jennifer for more perspectives on offshore wind transmission planning and community benefits. Hello there, thanks so much uh, for the introduction and uh, great to be here with you all today. I'm, bear with me here while I too try to put my slides up. Um, I did warn folks that I was not sure if they did this despite many years now of practice. Okay, can you, do you see my full screen? Yes, we can see it. Perfect, okay. Um, and to, I just wanna test one thing, when I do this, does anything move? Can you hear me by the way? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. There, okay, you hear me and, it, and the screen moved, right? Yes. Like that, okay, okay. Thanks, thanks for bearing with me there. Okay, uh, so again, great to be here and um, you know, delighted to talk about two examples of community benefit agreements that we have negotiated. 
um, as, as mentioned, I'm Jennifer Garvey. I work for Orsted. And um, I, if you're unfamiliar with Orsted, you know, I'm sure everyone here is. We're obviously talking to a very knowledgeable audience here. Global leader in offshore wind. And uh, you know, I really focus on our projects for New York, which we build together with Eversource, uh, which is New England's largest energy provider and a premier transmission builder. Um, and I say that only because I, I recognize that we have projects in many other states in our kind of our footprint there, it looks different. Uh, we have different partners in different places, but just wanted to give you the context and credit also to Eversource since uh, you know, they've been great partners to us here in New York and we, and we do everything together. Uh, but we have two projects for New York that we are building. Uh, the first is South Fork Wind, uh, which will be the state's very first offshore wind project. It's actually under construction right now, as I'm sure you've heard, um, lots of uh, good, good parts of it are wrapping up uh, as we speak. Last week, actually, we, we celebrated the conclusion of the work in Town Rose, which um, has a lot to do with our community benefit agreement that I'll be talking about here shortly. Um, but that project, just to you know, remind everyone you know, where it is and where it plugs into, you see our lease area here uh, in blue, and uh, South Fork Wind will connect into the town of East Hampton on the very east end of Long Island on the South Fork. Um, you know, when it's finished, it'll have, it, it will power about 70,000 homes. Um, and then right behind it, we have Sun Sunrise Wind, a much larger project uh, that will, will connect uh, to the local grid in the middle of Long Island. It's a community called Holbrook in the town of Brookhaven in Suffolk County. Um, and so, you know, the, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about these two communities because they're very different and that, um, you know, that's an important part to recognize. Uh, you know, in the development of a community benefit agreement. And, um, and Laura, thank you for that terrific overview, because, I mean, I've, I've heard every concern that you mentioned about offshore wind um, in, in coming up with these community benefit agreements and just talking about the, the project generally. So um, it, was, it was really a great uh, overview of kind of what we, what we face on the ground. And I, and I would also mention too, I mean, yes, I've been integral in all of these, in, the, in these community benefit agreements and also in the outreach associated with them. So the listening part is, um, is really, really a key part of the process, of course, and, uh, you know, engaging early and having countless conversations is, is obviously, um, as you say, it's, it's fundamental to, to developing strong agreements and to citing projects successfully. So with, with recognizing, you know, kind of our footprint here, let me just drill down to what our actual onshore transmission footprint looks like. And I, I do wanna be clear that, um, you know, we're talking about community benefit agreements that were really negotiated specific to the real estate that is needed to site our project. So obviously there's an awful lot of stakeholders to consider in any offshore wind project. Um, and they're not all encompassed, of course, in this in this project and this and uh, the community agreements that I'm that I'll be talking about. So these were really developed um, together with the local entities that would grant us the real estate rights to allow our projects to go forward, um, and, and you know, and in, in the selection of the route for the for each project. And so that's really um, the focus of of our of our um, of our terms. But just to, to give you a little insight into what it was like to, um, you know, to work towards these agreements, um, you know, obviously South Fork Wind was the first project uh, that we've that we've focused on, um, and that was a power project, uh, a power, a, excuse me, a power power contract essentially that was awarded back in 2017. So I've been on that project since that time, and uh, the community benefit agreements was something that we, you know, we really focused on. For, it took several years, to be honest. Um, it was a, a long discussion. Um, and so just to give you a little backdrop on the location that we were working in, the town of East Hampton, if you've heard of the Hamptons, um, that's where it, where it is. Uh, and so um, these are, it's a, it's a unique area in that it's um, very expensive real estate, uh, some of the most expensive in the nation. Um, you know, really, you know, well recognized. We have gorgeous beaches all over the South Shore of Long Island, of course, um, and they're precious and well protected, and uh, you know, a real uh, near and dear to to everyone's heart. Uh, and so, the the protection of the beaches was a, a critical point throughout the discussions. Uh, but we, you know, we ultimately selected this route that you see here on the left. It's about four miles long, and half of it, about two miles, was located in. Uh, lightly traveled residential roads, again, amongst some of the most, you know, the most ex expensive uh, real estate that exists, frankly. Uh, and then about half of it uh, was along the railroad corridor, 
um, um, you know, on the way to the substation. So that gives you just a high level overview of kind of what we were working with. I will also emphasize that this is a very seasonal community. Um, most of the homes, particularly within the footprint that we were working with, you know, south of the of the railroad corridor, um, you know, there's there's seasonal homes, summertime, and occasional weekends at best. Uh, so it gives you a sense of you know what it's like to be in the area. And we were subject to a number of work restrictions. We were only allowed to construct our project, for example, in the in the town roads, um, you know, in the in the shoulder months and in the winter months. You know, no no work during the summertime. Uh, by contrast, and of course, we had to just want to emphasize everything is underground. All of our all of our our, our transmission infrastructure was underground, uh, and then we had to build some interconnection facilities, another substation, which happened to be adjacent to an existing substation. Uh, for Sunrise Wind, a very different scenario, uh, which is a much longer cable route, 18 miles of onshore routing, and um, and in general, the community is it's a it's just a very different community, um, much more uh, more densely populated. Um, residents who you know who live there year-round, um, very different on the socioeconomic scale, a spectrum rather, um, and just a you know a, a very different type of uh, type of area. Um, and so, just another thing to recognize too is that although property values were lowered, the taxes are much higher. The taxes are are, are astonishingly low in East Hampton uh, because there's so few people who who live there year round and thus demand the services, and so they're sort of subsidized by these um, these very these very expensive properties. Um, for the in Brookhaven town, um, you know, lots of people living there, lots of people you know using the services provided by the local government, the school systems in particular, for example, which are about 70% of our tax bills. Um, and so a very different landscape. And so here we have to cite this 18 miles of underground transmission line. Uh, we also have a converter station to site, uh, which is, uh, this is an HVDC system. And then also if you connect into the existing, uh, the existing substation connector, you know, to connect to the grid. So just a high level overview of, you know, what each community was like. Um, and so, you know, it's been a, it was really an interesting process to negotiate each, each of these agreements. Um, and ultimately, you know, we really focused on the sort of the miles associated with, uh, with the project in, in correlation to a form of, of impact, if you will. You are, we're recognizing that, uh, you know, hosting some temporary, it is, it is only temporary construction, of course, uh, very short term. I mean, we've just wrapped up in East Hampton, as I mentioned, and um, I think it's, it's really been, um, of a much lesser impact than any any of the residents may have anticipated, um, but you know this this has been the function of how we've focused on um, assigning benefits, um, and so you, you can see here how you know where we landed from a numbers perspective uh, for each agreement, and so obviously the, the East Hampton route is much shorter, um, and you get a, a look at what the total value of the community benefit agreement is that we that we negotiated. So the the dollars that you see here, I just want to be I want to point out that they also include the estimated tax uh, associated with the project as well. And as I mentioned, East Hampton has very, very low taxes. And so, um, you know, the, the, the cost of taxes over the life of the project were really very small. Thus, the, the community agreement numbers are, are a bit higher. In the case of Brookhaven, uh, in Brookhaven Town and negotiating that agreement, um, obviously, the, you know, the, the, the property taxes are extremely high. And so, actually, if you were to look at the undiscounted project, the undiscounted taxes associated with this project, um, you know, if we had to pay full freight, for example, would actually be considerably higher than what you even see here. Um, but there was a recognition, certainly, that um, that's you know, that is not the spirit in which um, you know the tax structure is intended. Uh, you know, transmission projects like these are underground. Um, they're out of sight, out of mind, basically don't require services, no, no, no students going to school, for example. Um, you know, there's, there's one building in the converter station, the substation that are above ground, again, don't really don't require the local services. And so there was uh, a, a certainly an understanding on, the, on behalf of the, the boards that we're dealing with locally that a payment in lieu of taxes is, is typical um, and, and a reduction in the, the tax uh, allocation would be, uh, in a, would, would be would be appropriate, uh, and instead we were able to provide a host community agreement that has more flexibility in spending for the local um, town, for example, um, in order and so that they could better allocate uh, the you know the, the 
the fees that we were generating um, in the manner that they, that they saw fit uh, and that was a better fit for the, for the local community. So for example, in a, in a way that it could be a little more disjointed, if we, the converter station, for example, is a, um, is a, a considerable part of the, the cost associated with um, the tax obligation that would accrue to a single school district that otherwise is feeling very little impact, for example, from, from our onshore footprint. And so by you know, agreeing instead to this, this discounted pilot and moving money into the host community uh, column, if you will, that allowed for the town to sort of distribute the, the funds in a, in a more equitable fashion. So this is just a, a high level overview. These are all public numbers, I might add. If you'd like more information about these agreements, they're certainly available online. You're welcome to reach out to me as well. This is a, an overview of, sort of, of the correlation between these two projects um, and, and how we focused really on, on the miles impact. There are, of course, other bespoke um, uh, sort of parts of our agreement. For example, you mentioned workforce. Uh, int interest in workforce um, requirements, for example, we have commitments to, you know, to advertise our, our, our jobs, for example, there are commitments to uh, local, uh, local benefits, for example, such as certain park, park benefits or park improvements, that was important in the town of Brookhaven. Uh, for, the, for the South Fork agreement, there's an agreement where there's an understanding that uh, a, a portion of the funds would go directly to the Wayne Scott community, which is the hamlet in the larger town of East Hampton that is really hosting the onshore footprint. And so um, anyway, all of our discussions with the community and with the town um, allowed us to, to best structure uh, the agreement. I did want to note actually that one thing that was really interesting in, in drafting these is that we initially, as a result of our listening tour, if you will, we, we, we've done many, many community meetings in both locations. We had initially uh, for South Park when suggested some categories of spend. Um, that the, the agreement might be based on. And instead, the town preferred to kind of keep it a, a flat dollar amount and then to allocate the funds themselves so they could prescribe um, you know, how the funds would be spent over time. And it would also keep it more flexible, recognizing that obviously needs can change over time. So that was uh, one interesting development uh, that sort of occurred over, over the course of discussions. And then ultimately Brookhaven elected to do the same shy a couple of um, park improvements, for example, that they were that they were really interested in. And so I will go to just a, a quick sort of summary points of some of the ways, some of the things that we've um, that we've that we've that we've talked about internally, and of you know uh, sort of principles that we've been thinking about with respect to some of these agreements. But certainly these these agreements are are real selling points for offshore wind transmission. I mean. You are citing, you know, that you are um, enduring some sort short-term construction, uh, but it's been really interesting to see, particularly with from the perspective of different electeds, they really see it as an opportunity both to um, be proud of the fact that they're hosting, uh, you know, clean energy transmission uh, connected to an offshore wind farm and, and lots of clean power, obviously, um, but also that they they recognize there's real there's obvious benefits that results from, from doing so. And so it's, it's been a real selling point for us and a, a way that we've seen a lot of bipartisan uh, support for our projects. Um, and again, there is just, there is really no formula for, um, for these types of agreements. It really depends on the community that you're, that you're, that you're talking with, kind of the playing field in the community. There's so many different, um, you know, communities vary in so many different ways. It's hard to, it's hard to point to a single formula. So it is a true negotiation. Um, and again, I just want to be sure I'm, I'm being clear that it's really these the agreements that I'm talking about are just specific to real estate recognize that there's many other stakeholders that we will have that we would, you know, that we would engage with in different ways. Um, and this is really just limited to the, the, the transmission footprint, for example. Um, one of the challenges, though, that, that can certainly occur is that there is no uh, these are these tend to be discretionary agreements. They don't have clear, you know, real frameworks or timelines. And so sometimes just the process of like driving to a decision can can take a long time. It can be difficult. Um, and if depending on the entity that you're dealing with, in both instances, we happen to have been dealing with um, the town governments. Um, in East Hampton, we actually have two forms of government, the town board, and then there's a um, another another entity known as the, the town trustees that have jurisdiction of the beaches. And so um, just getting two boards to agree and going through different elections, for example, seeing changes in leadership, you know, all of those have, have been, um, you know, just 
bumps along the way, if you will. And so it just takes time to negotiate these agreements. And sometimes um, because offshore wind feels new, obviously it has a, you know, very, um, a real track record around the globe, but it's newer, it's new to us here. And so, you know, we see people, we see a lot of interest in other parts of the project, even though the agreements that we were dealing with were really focused on the transmission footprint. Lots of questions would come up about what's happening offshore and impacts offshore and so on and so forth. Um, with respect to some of the impacts that were, and the concerns that have come up that, that, um, that were noted earlier, um, we, I think we were successful in being able to move a lot of the um, mitigations for those concerns into the permitting sphere. And so they all came up at once. You know, you're, you're talking to a community, to a, a town board, and, you know, their, their concerns and, and their interests are coming up all at once. And then being able to direct the solution to, you know, the permitting framework versus a community benefit agreement was important uh, in terms of how we separated them. And so I think they rightfully ended up, um, you know, address some of those mitigations like depth under the beach, for example, or EMF concerns have rightly ended up in, um, in the permitting, uh, the uh, permitting mitigations, for example, that were negotiated through the Public Service Commission. Thank you, thank you Jennifer. Uh, that's, that's a really interesting perspective on the kind of on the ground uh, interaction be with the uh, stakeholders in a way that, um, I, 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 I haven't listened to a lot of kind of uh, eyewitness uh, descriptions of how that how all that goes. So thank you. That's really interesting. Um, I think we're ready to uh, progress to the next part of our um, of, our, of our discussion and, and turn this into a little bit more of a discussion between each other. I'd like to invite uh, my colleague Nick Napoli, uh, who's the senior advisor to the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean and the executive director of the Northeast Regional Ocean Council. Uh, to join, join us on the stage. Um, among his many responsibilities are managing the outreach data development and ocean planning and management requirements for the Mid-Atlantic and regional uh, and Northeast Ocean data portals, which we've, we've heard about uh, quite a bit. Nick is going to uh, help me synthesize some of the questions and the feedback we're receiving since I can't see all the chat. I, I, we are definitely getting questions because I can see there's uh, some coming in on the chat and I think we've had some in the room as well. Um, so, Nick, have, what kind of questions have we got? <laughs> uh, I need to get the questions from <laughs> Janet. What? <laughs> <laughs> I want to. I could ask a question. <laughs> Go for it. All right, the first one is for uh, Dr. Fu. ISOs, RTOs seem large to make price comparisons. Why this broad comparison rather than comparing local marginal prices at nodes along the coast as they may be more relevant than comparing to prices that would be influenced by prices in, for example, Western PJM, parentheses, uh, West Virginia and Ohio. Repeat it again, sorry. Yes. <laughs> That's important. ISOs, RTOs seem large to make price comparisons. Why this broad comparison rather than comparing local marginal prices at nodes along the coast as they may be more relevant than comparing to prices that would be influenced by prices in, for example, Western PJM? I think it's more like uh, we identify those price gaps along the coastal lines. Um, that's what the value of offshore wind transmission, right? If we go all the way down inland and try to con connect those west of PJM that, or even go to MISOs, what's the point of building offshore transmission, right? We could use some onshore connections to reduce some congestion, but that requires maybe it's Greenfield, uh, another right of ways approvals and maybe go through some really congested regions along the um, northeast corridor that will become a very difficult to build scenario. So we're just looking at ways that we can identify different nodes that can connect through the offshore um, space. The next question 
is, uh, and I think this might be for um, Jennifer or Laura. Do CBAs, community benefit agreements, include higher education? Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the answer is it absolutely can, can include um, education. But again, it's like it, what Jennifer's saying, this is something that's really um, worked on, collaborated, you have to engage with the community to figure out what that community needs. Um, but education and workforce are absolutely part of it. And maybe for, I'm, I'm turning, but I'm, I'm looking at the screen. Um, but maybe Jennifer can add to that. I don't know if that's been a community sure. question too. Yeah, I mean, I would say, of course they can. You know, I, as I mentioned, I was talking about something specific to a transmission footprint, but it's worth mentioning that other parts of our project, I mean, we have R&D partnerships with universities. You know, we work closely with um, the state as a, uh, an offshore wind development institute, for example, that the developers, all of the developers, not just us, are, are closely engaged with. So it doesn't fit, I wouldn't, it just doesn't, in my mind, fit under, the, under the, the bucket of community benefit agreement, but it's all happening, you know, together. And so, you know, you could, there's, they're all community benefits associated with these projects and higher education is definitely part of it. I can, uh, I have a question on, um, it, it, seem, it seems that there's been a kind of who moves first uh, kind of issue with, cla with, um, with uh, transmission solutions that, you know, the coordinated transmission solutions, that's what I was looking for, where you have uh, state governments and you have the federal government and it's a little bit like who's going to lead the dance and uh, who's going to kind of start this process off. Um, how, do you, how do we break the stalemate and, and kind of get, just get going with some of the planning that needs to be happening on this? And what does the, uh, the DOE study and work plan have to contribute to this problem? <laughs> <laughs> how we answer that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's more, I think there are some ongoing discussion of standing up a uh, state-federal coalition on leveraging existing uh, established of similar organizations. So that um, it's really hard to say who's going to lead. I think that all of the party has to work together. You know, it's just if single-handed or handicapping multiple things. Yeah, I'll add that, um, you know, the, the tools such as the study, um, provide information to allow uh, different levels of actors to act at different times and, and in conjunction with one another towards uh, sort of a shared goal. Um, and, and one of the things that, that, that I think we heard was was that, you know, we, we really do need sort of a collaborative uh, federal, tribal, state, local government body of some type to, to really discuss specific proposals when we get to that point of implementation. Um, and so, you know, one model is, of course, uh, our renewable energy task forces, the New York Bright task force, for example, could be leveraged to, to play a role. Um, there could also be, a, you know, a state-led approach where, uh, you know, states have very specific issues that, that they want to work with each other to, to contribute. And so um, I think that my answer would be that, that it's not a one-size-fits-all. It, it really is uh, an all-government uh, approach where different actors play play different roles, but but head towards the same same goals. Can I, can I jump in here too? Um, I, I I think I echo those sentiments broadly. In that I think, but but I but I, I hope that the report will be sort of a jumping off point for creating the fora in which those kinds of interactions happen with regularity. I think from the state perspective, um, and New Jersey in particular, because we have a discrete schedule in which we're supposed to work towards achieving our 11 gigawatt goal by 2040, and so we're, we have a published schedule on which our solicita solicitations happen. So we are going to keep marching along um, and with an eye towards coordinated transmission as best we can, um, but we're on a timetable. And so trying to figure out how we can get to a forum in which all parties are engaging in a way that that moves the ball forward towards more coordination, I think, would be helpful. So uh, quite hopeful that the effort that, uh, you know, uh, Gian and, and Josh talked about is going to be a, a big jumping off point to getting us to these um, more detailed conversations about how we get to a more coordinated approach among the various different stakeholders. Thanks. I've got more questions. Do we have time for one more? 
Okay. Oh, no, you do. Great. Go for it. We, we got another one. Um, oh. Jen, I don't know if Jen can hear me because I don't have a mic. Okay, it's on now. Hi, Jen. This is Jess Dealey from Jeff. NYSERDA. And Laura, I know you as well. I work on the offshore wind team as a senior advisor on workforce, and we are have an eye on these community benefit agreements as they come about. And we're starting to see, you know, as there, there is no model for it, obviously, and they're each specific to their own communities, but they're getting quite expensive. And we certainly don't want ratepayers to deal with, uh, you know, more expensive electricity prices because community benefit agreements go up to 250 million plus, you know? So how do we make sure, is there a way to, to give a range to communities as to what to expect or perhaps like a, a ceiling that we, we want to not go past for community benefit agreements? And then the second part of my question is, because a lot of these community benefit agreements are distributed from the towns or the local governments at whatever time they would like to and to whatever resources they would like to, to fund, how do we make sure that the benefits are going to those that have historically been left out of receiving this type of funding? How do we track and make sure you know, that these benefits are real for environmental justice communities and indigenous nations? So that's a little bit about what's on my mind and the questions I had for you two. Um, I'm gonna turn it actually to Jennifer first for the question, for Jess's first question about the ratepayer impact and the prices, because I think she could answer that better than I. So sure, so with respect to the ratepayer impacts, I mean, you know, our, our contracts are fixed. So when we agree to a project, you know, we, we are assigned pricing, we have, you know, our pricing is fixed. And so we have to work within uh, you know the budgets that we have. Um, you know that we have that we have we have bid, for example, for our for our um, for our projects. And so, it's a great question. You know what happens if the negotiations, if you say as you say, sort of get really pricey. Um, I mean, that I don't know that I have a great answer for that. I mean, the you know the it can be a real problem for a project. Um, I think it's useful to have parameters. Um, I, you know, I mentioned some of the some of the some of the points that informed our agreements, which were the you know the tax obligation, for example, um, you know, and, and how that in some instances it's more appropriately shifted from an actual you know your, your standard tax structure into a host community agreement that has a different uh, different fund spending flexibility. It's almost like a restructuring of taxes, uh, but it is it is a it, it can be a difficult point for projects, and so. Um, you know, I think we'll have to, I think part of it too is we have to work together with regulators to see if we can come up with parameters. I think it's, I think it's wise. It's always useful to have predictability in these projects in terms of the frameworks of, of spending, for example, then you avoid, for example, a either, you know, a, a, a cost that is so astronomical for a project that it upends a business case. It also prevents developers from pricing in extra extra funds, you know, because they're anticipating that there might be a blockbuster cost and you don't want them to end up with a windfall either. And so it's difficult to work that line. Um, and we're in early days here, obviously. So those are all things that I think we should be thinking about as this industry moves forward and, and trying to put parameters on those types of agreement because it, it'll just lead to greater transparency for everybody if we're able to, to set those, those guidelines. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, and I mean, I'm happy to take the second half. I think this is what um, a lot of what I was covering in terms of, you know, we said that the community benefit agreements could be flexible, but that's more of the type that you actually create. But they should be legally binding, right? So, and that's the two-way street. You go out and you reach out to these historically underrepresented communities. You reach out to the tribes where they are who often don't have the resources, and you figure out a means of fair compensation and then you have an agreement so that it's tracked, right? And so that that's the, it's public, it's transparent, everybody knows it's there, the developer has that obligation, and then, you know, the community is working hand in hand. So I think that's what really has to happen because like you said, it could be, you know, we do have a range of communities, right? You have the very wealthy ones that Joe was talking about, right? You've got the sort of the East Hampton, and then you have the folks who it could be that the landing site 
is where somebody already has already been an environmental justice, historically disadvantaged community, which often happens, right? We have courts, we have in New York, right? We have certain areas where there's been a lot of um, negotiations and conversations with EJ communities so that we can actually build up the ports um, and other areas surrounding where the manufacturing is. Um, and those aren't again, and I think I keep pointing behind me, but what Jen had said, I know I said, um, but about these, maybe not exactly CBAs, but just the type of agreements that you can have to make sure that the investments are going to the right communities. So I think that's the, that's kind of the rub is to make sure it's actually going here. Thanks, Laura. Um, I think to uh, keep us on, on time, I'd like to hand it over to, uh, to Nick Napoli to give us a quick summary of, of what we've heard and, and where the transmission planning series could be going. Thank you, Wright. Um, so I was asked to wrap this up, um, and I am standing between you and after hours networking, um, which I assume means Tony's taking us out for drinks. Um, so yes, is that a yes? yes. Yeah, awesome. OK, uh, so I'll be quick. Um, I'm also not an expert. Um, he's the transmission guy. <laughs> um, they didn't even invite me to the transmission lunch. Um, so, but, <laughs> uh, but I think that's the point um, of this panel, actually, um, and, and the series uh, that we started with a couple years ago, um, because I'm probably kind of like the rest of you or most of you in that this is not a topic that much of the community within Marco and NROC uh, that participates in Marco and NROC is really all that an expert in. And, um, so that was the goal of the webinar series that we started two years ago, was to bring uh, this expertise to the coastal management community that participates in Marco and NROC. Um, and I think I'm just gonna approach it from that perspective about what possible next steps we could have. Um, Marco and NROC have suggested that we would have a, a follow-up webinar or workshop for this. Uh, and uh, when we started two years ago, we it was different, or three, two, Actually, we started developing that webinar series three years ago. Uh, we held it two years ago. Things were different. Um, and um, the Atlantic Offshore Wind Transmission Study didn't even start yet. Um, and now we're almost completed with it. And um, I think that, as you heard uh, today, there's probably an opportunity to really understand the details of it a little better. I think John even mentioned right off the bat that 15 minutes um, was really not enough to really understand that. And certainly they have their own opportunities for engaging in that project and understanding it better. But there's perhaps something more we can do uh, to better understand what the coastal management role is in, in relation to that uh, study and how it'll get implemented. Um, certainly, uh, we'd all like to hear more from the transmission guy, I assume, on the, especially on the roles between I'm just gonna keep using that. <laughs> Thank you, right? Um, in the roles between federal government, the grid operators and the states, and again, that's another dense topic that, that requires more than 15 minutes, I think. Um, and then Kira, we, we heard from, uh, in terms of the New Jersey uh, efforts, two years ago we heard, uh, it, was, it was really the, um, the suggestion from the state that PGM should include um, the offshore wind goal in, in RTEP, and now they've gone through two years of, of trying to figure out what that means. Um, and I, I would imagine that there's some lessons learned there that we heard a little bit about that are probably appropriate for some of the other states, and that might be something else we could dig into. Um, all three of you mentioned regional coordination. That's what Marco and NROC do. Uh, but we're not necessarily transmission experts, so I'd ask all of you to sort of suggest to us where it's helpful to, to um, coordinate the community that's before you um, with regard to the next steps. That would be great to know. Um, and then last with Laura and, and, and Jennifer, um, community concerns um, is something that probably um, Marco and NROC can do more about understanding um, and incorporating into um, their considerations um, with regard to the individual states and the agencies that participate in, in Marco and NROC. Um, and also, um, I was thinking about some of when Jennifer was going through the, the values associated with the CBAs, I was thinking about if there are any best practices there that could be much like 
many are working on with regard to the, the compensatory mitigation for fisheries, you know, are there, are there practices, best practices for valuing um, the uh, CBA related to transmission? Um, and then I'd say more generally, recognizing what you all said, these CBAs are very specific to the communities, the projects, but are there best practices in terms of um, developing a community benefit agreement? Are there ways in which the states can work with the communities to be more prepared for that? That's my thoughts. Um, I'd like the transmission guy to <laughs> tell me if I did okay. <laughs> no, no I, I think it sounded good. And uh, you know, I do think that, that there's, a, there's an important role to play for organizations like yours in that, you know, for example, the transmission recommendations report um, as I alluded to, uh, you know, I think it's it's over 90 pages at this point. So there, yeah. there's there's no shortage of, of, of points of engagement um, where, where you know we, we really do need to leverage the expertise of, of you and, and, and the network on, on the ground in how to best implement things. You know, it, it is more of a framework document, and so each recommendation as it's implemented really needs that that coordination piece. So I appreciate um, your, your your volunteering to to engage with us in the future on that. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for letting me put you on the spot there. <laughs> but I think the request is also to the Marco and NROC community. It's it, within these topics, what more do you need to hear about with, in terms of what your role is in these projects um, related to transmission? So please let us know, because that will help us. Uh, it's not up to me to decide that we have a workshop about something specific. It really comes from all of you. Um, there's some opportunities, I think, within some of the presentations we heard today to understand these things better, make it relate it to the coastal management community. Um, but I really want to hear from you all as to where it's, what is, is needed. Thank you. Thanks. I think uh, it's time, Tony's turn to come up and close us out. No? Oh, I'm sorry. So this is our, our Menti um, survey about what Nick was saying. We're trying to get our feedback from you. So if you could please, and this is for folks online as well, you can go to menti.com and with a smartphone, uh, a tablet, the computer that you're working on, or if you've got a second laptop sitting next to you, you're going to enter this code that's at the top of the screen. It's 17444075. And we'd like you to just take a second and answer this question. So when we're thinking about um, offshore wind transmission, if you could please rank the following topics that are of most interest or importance to you, and that was, would be with number one being the most important or interesting. Thank you. I feel like we might need background music next time we do one of these, but so. yeah. <laughs> Is this one not gonna jump around like the last one? Okay, that's fun to watch. I think I'm going to compete with the uh, jumping thing a little bit. We're going to keep that open for people who want to get your feedback on that. But I think I will 
just uh, take a few minutes uh, to sort of wrap up a little bit today, but again, it's not going to be a wrap up in trying to summarize what you all heard because it was incredibly um, robust and dense information that we heard. But I, I do have a couple of, of takeaways and I want to set us up a little bit uh, for tomorrow. So uh, first, before I start, I do want to welcome Avalon Bristow, who I impersonated not very well this morning. Uh, she's the executive director of Marco and she and her staff have really been uh, crucial in actually making this all happen. Um, so really welcome and glad you were able to make it. So thank you. And, and I guess, uh, you know, I have, uh, I think, I hope we all have a lot of takeaways. I want to take us back to the way Mike uh, set us off this morning to really uh, be thinking about this as an opportunity to connect and really recognizing to think about Hopefully there's not only somebody who's been on one of these panels and the information we'll share with you that you will plan on following up with. Um, that's very much uh, at the essence of why we're having these meetings and the essence of what Marco and Mako are trying to do is try to build these connections. And if there's any message I heard consistently through every presentation was the need for more of this collaboration across some issues. So please take that to heart um, and also <clears throat> recognize that tomorrow we'll, be, we'll have more opportunities. We can actually serve lunch here, so you'll have an hour and a half to opportunity to follow up with people in that regard. Uh, also, coming back to some of the first principles, I was really uh, taken with some of Keisha's uh, charge to us to be really thinking about this as a long-term problem. I mean, so much of it gets transactional, so much of it gets specific, so much of it gets you know really detailed, which is important, and we can follow up with all these people to figure out the details. But our objective here is regional ocean management over time and thinking about the planning for the future. So I really am taken very much with her charge to keep equity centered in what we do. And equity, I have heard defined very broadly throughout this context. I've heard equity and access in ways that don't just only speak to indigenous rights or only and speak to DEIJ, but really talking about communities. And the core thing that I heard consistently in everybody is, do they, are they listened to? In fact, lots of discussion of stakeholders. I've been in this business longer than that, way before 2009, uh, but thinking about these kind of issues. But really, I do think there's a profound change right now in how we can express this information and listen to communities and provide them the capacity, not give them the tools, but provide them the ca capacity to feel their voice included in what we do. And I did hear that in every panel in a very different way, so thinking about that. I would say a couple of other general takeaways for me and also looking forward uh, to tomorrow as we really did think, I'm really pleased that we centered the tribal geo uh, uh, separation today because I really feel like it raised a lot of issues which are lessons learned that could be brought to these other panels and were reflected to some extent, but I feel we centered that and we sort of presented that in a way that hopefully informed some of our thinking about this. We started with oceans and climate. It's the driver. It is the thing that is happening to us. It is a thing that is happening in the environment. It is happening. And as somebody said at a conference I was at, it's like we really need to listen a little bit better to what's going on in the ecosystem because they've been doing what they've been doing for millions and millions and millions of years. And so we think we're fixing the problem. We need to be listening a little bit more to what the lessons we can learn by knowing more about our environment and the impacts we're having on that. So I would like to say that that is the sort of theme we sort of started out with. We had fantastic presenta presentations around oceans, not only as part of the solution to climate change, but also be thinking about how we then actually have to, and I think it was Mary Kamhai who made the comment, don't forget, this is only a human-centric environment, that we do need to front biodiversity, we do need to understand what the environment is telling us about what we are doing as humans. So that was sort of a, a good framing for me anyway, and something that will bring us into tomorrow, because we'll have a specific session on ocean conservation tomorrow and be highlighting some of the work that we're doing at Marco and some of the work that we're doing with others. I think that's another takeaway. We have come a long way, baby, in this process. Um, so the regional ocean data portal was started before ocean planning. I've now been three in, through three different iterations of regional ocean planning and what it means and what it should mean. And I think we're about, I think I heard we're about to enter the fourth iteration, which is for planning for sustainable ocean economies. For somebody who's been around in this field for a long time, we used to talk about this integrated coastal zone management. Isn't that what we used to talk about, Laura? So we're actually coming back to first principles to some extent, but we're empowered by all the incredible work that's being done by folks like DOE and others around the information and thinking about these as integrated problems. I think that's really another fundamental change that we heard about today through some of our panels, particularly um, this, this last panel. 
Um, the other aspect that I'll talk about is community a little bit. Uh, that's a word that we've heard that everybody seems to suggest is important. I think we need to do a little bit work, more work about what that means by community. Is it your local government? Is it the tribal nations? Is it the frameworks? Is it the framework? So I do think we need to unravel a little bit more, and I say that because at Marco, what we think about is really, uh, and, and as Nick said, as cultural zone management professionals, we sort of think a little bit about really what that community looks like day to day, and they, frankly, they can absorb all this information. We don't need to make it simpler for them, but we do need to listen to them to understand what information they actually, in fact, do need, not to understand what you're saying to them, but to help them express what they need in this process and how we get from here to there. So those are my kind of general takeaways. There's lots of specifics as well. Uh, but again, we're going to follow up with that. We're going to be having additional workshops. We're going to be doing additional work. You'll hear about that tomorrow uh, as well. So we'll start tomorrow again at the very personal level. We'll start with this allyship session. So I do really encourage everybody to come back to that. We decided really, we, this is, we're trying to give everybody maybe a little bit of an experience about to take back into your own workplace and think about how we impo impose that in your workplace, not solving the regional ocean problems. And then we'll move on to the conservation sessions and we'll end up with a session on planning for sustainable ocean economy. So again, be here at nine o'clock, is that right? Tomorrow, so please be here on time. And those online, thank you very much for, for your patience and listening to us and everybody who made this happen today. Appreciate it very much. Thank you.